Good evening, and welcome to Worcester Historical Museum's virtual program on Worcester State Hospital from 1833 to the present. If we've not met, I'm Bill Wallace. I'm the Executive Director of Worcester Historical Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening on behalf of not only our presenter, Madeline, a member of our staff, but also our friends at Tidepool Bookstore, our entire staff at the museum, our volunteers, our friends, our members, and all of you. We are able to present this evening's program to the, with the support of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fred Harris Daniels Foundation, and the Worcester Together Fund. We are really grateful for their support as we all negotiate our way out of a, a very unusual year and into an exciting future, for not only Worcester's past, but also its future, our, our mission at Worcester Historical Museum. Our partner in this program tonight is Tidepool Bookstore. Tidepool Bookstore is, is with us this evening in, in the um, person of one of our trustees at Worcester Historical Museum, Joe Tuesdale, Josephine Rose Lincoln Heron Tuesdale, who will tell us all about this new adventure at Tidepool and will welcome our speaker. Josephine. So Tidepool Bookshop is absolutely delighted to be a part of this fabulous program. Uh, people have already been coming into the bookstore looking for Madeline's book, a number of them saying that they had worked at the hospital or that they had relatives who had worked there. And I actually also had a relative who worked there. My great, great grandfather, George Chandler, was the superintendent for 10 years in the mid 1800s. And my great grandmother grew up, grew up playing on the grounds of the hospital. So like everyone joining in this evening, I've been very much looking forward to, uh, to tonight. So tonight, Dr. Ryan will, be provide, will provide us with a basic overview of the history of the hospital and provide historical context of society's relationship with mental health past to present, situating the history of Worcester's society, economy, and development. Tonight's program is on a webinar platform. You know what, I'm just gonna come back because I just wanted to mention that our speaker, Madeline Kieran Ryan, is the uh, project development librarian at the Worcester Historical Museum. She holds a PhD in anthropology from Brown University and is the author of two books on the Worcester State Hospital. Images of America, Worcester State Hospital, co-authored with Katherine Anderson, published by Arcadia in 2021, and A Refuge of Cure or Care, the Sensory Dimensions of Confinement at the Worcester State Hospital, published by Lexington Books, also in 2021. So tonight, Dr. Ryan will provide us with a, with a, a basic uh, overview of the history of the hospital and provide historical context of society's relationship with mental health, past to present, situating the history of Worcester's society, economy, and development. The program is on a webinar platform, and we'll have a Q&A beginning around 7.45, but please feel free to submit any questions you may have as the program is taking place by writing them in the Q&A section on the Zoom, and Bill Wallace will then relay the questions to Madeline at the end of her talk. So without further ado, and I'm sorry for whatever confusion happened, uh, but we welcome uh, uh, Madeline. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, all right, so thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to share what has been a few years now of research on the Worcester State Hospital. And I'd like to begin by making a brief disclaimer on the language that I use in this presentation. Um, I choose to use the words lunatic and insane because they were the medical diagnostic terms of the 19th century. These terms are not directly equivalent to present day conceptions of mental illness because they include things that are really not considered psychiatric or even pathological today. For example, I've seen people who were labeled insane for homosexuality, for cross-dressing, and even in several cases for disagreeing with their husband's religion. And for this reason, I choose to use the terms that reflect insanity as it was defined in this particular context. As I move into the 20th century, you'll see me shift into terms like mental illness and mental disease, which were what was then used. So this might be a, a familiar sight to some of you. The clock tower off Belmont Street has occupied its position on the landscape for almost 150 years. It once formed the center of the massive 19th century complex of the Worcester State Hospital. To present day onlookers, the hospital might evoke the stigma of a dark chapter in mental health care. 
However, this perception obscures the genuine spirit of optimism and charity in which the institution was founded. Worcester State Hospital and other institutions like it were based on a groundbreaking program known as moral treatment. Now to give a brief overview of what I'll talk about in this presentation. To begin with, I'll discuss what was moral treatment, what were its origins, objectives, and defining principles. Then I'll talk a little bit about both the first and the second Worcester State Hospitals and how each of them was designed according to the principles of moral treatment. I will then talk about why moral treatment declined and the effect this had on the Worcester State Hospital and on the history of psychiatry. And lastly, I'll give a summary of the events in psychiatry and at the Worcester State Hospital over the last few decades. So what was moral treatment? Moral treatment was a holistic institutional program for the, for the treatment of insanity. By holistic, I mean that it targeted every part of the mind and body. So it wasn't specifically targeted at, a, at one bodily system. Um, it was supposed to address the whole person. By institutional, I mean that this could only take place in an institutional setting. This was not a form of treatment that you could go to your local physician and get a prescription for or could have administered at home. It was tied to its particular environment. Moral treatment originated in France and England of the late 18th and early 19th century. And it was foremost spiritual, not medical in character, although it later became absorbed into medicine. The key components of moral treatment included foremost the environment, so that institutional setting, consisting of a well-organized hospital building with all the necessary facilities for daily life, including pleasant accommodations, a bucolic landscape, and a farm to create a self-sufficient economy. Secondly, it would have involved a daily regimen consisting of a wholesome diet, moderate labor, sufficient rest, recreation, intellectual and physical activity, and socialization. And last of all, it would rest on the administration of individualized care. So a supportive and well-trained staff would provide humane treatment to patients and thereby encourage mutual trust. And this, it was thought, would minimize the need for restraint or coercion. On the one hand, moral treatment was very old-fashioned in its character. It incorporated a variety of common sense, traditional ideas about health that had been passed down for generations. But at the same time, this was a very modern and groundbreaking program, and a lot of that had to do with the institutional setting itself. So the whole idea that the environment um, could be this singular, self-sustaining and therapeutic place for people suffering from a particular type of illness was pretty revolutionary. And furthermore, the very idea that lunatics could be cured was revolutionary. Um, previously, they had been kind of cast aside um, as, as hopeless, and a lot of them had been subject to very poor treatment. To give a bit of background on the state of Massachusetts and New England at the time, the 18th and 19th centuries witnessed some pretty dramatic social changes, including industrialization, urbanization, and a pretty massive growth of population. Under these circumstances, the number of people who appeared, who suffered from insanity, appeared to be increasing quite dramatically. For this reason, in 1829, the Massachusetts State Legislature decided to launch an investigation in which they would look into the condition of every person who was labeled insane in the state. And what they found was incredibly shocking. They saw accounts of paupers, pauper lunatics who were dressed in rags, living in dark dungeons, and who were living in a state of abuse and neglect. And for this reason, the legislators drafted a resolution to create one of the first public institutions for the insane in the United States. 
the idea of an institution that would be based on the principles of moral treatment was pretty quick to catch hold in Massachusetts because it was already kind of inundated with this progressive humanitarian atmosphere. It also had a very robust social welfare system going back to colonial times. Worcester was chosen out of all the cities or other towns in the state um, because of its central location and also because of its status as an up and coming economic and intellectual hub. This picture shows the first Worcester State Hospital built in 1833. It was located on Summer Street in the heart of downtown Worcester. And it was this building that really put Worcester on the map as a pioneer in moral treatment. In fact, state hospitals across the country would be built according to the model that was set at Worcester. The hospital consisted of 120 beds originally, it had a central administration building, which you can see here, which is flanked on either side by wards, one for men and one for women. And over time, it was augmented by the addition of uh, other wings and also by a variety of auxiliary buildings, like, as you can see here, um, a set of strong rooms or solitary cells, which were set apart from the main hospital and located um, somewhat par partially underground. And these cells were set aside for patients who were considered particularly violent or recalcitrant, and it was thought that it was harmful for them to mix with the other patients. But these were really undesirable places to live, and they became a huge point of contention among the administrators in years to come. This map shows the location of the original Worcester State Hospital. As you can see, in, as of 1833, this was still a pretty rural area of Worcester. It was abutting lots of nice rolling fields and agricultural places. But at the same time, there was a growing business district on one side, so it was conveniently close to all sorts of amenities. So this was considered an ideal location. This is a modern map showing the two locations of the Worcester State Hospital, one on Summer Street, on the present location of the post office, but also the property has been pretty much obliterated by 290. And then the second location on Belmont Street, as you can see in a much more remote area of the city. The first superintendent of the Worcester State Hospital was Samuel B. Woodward, and he would go on to gain lasting acclaim for his work at Worcester, revolutionary, uh, revolutionizing the perception and treatment of insanity. His administration was characterized by its very effusive optimism. So this, this optimism was known as the cult of curability. And that was basically the belief, which was shared by a lot of physicians at the time, that insanity was a very curable disease. In fact, Woodward during his tenure claimed that 90% of the patients who were admitted to the hospital within a, a certain amount of time after the onset of their illness would experience a cure. But despite all of this optimism, the institution quickly encountered major problems, the first and foremost of which was that it exceeded its capacity within its first few months. As you can see here, there were a succession of different additions that were put on the hospital throughout the 19th century. But despite these additions, the hospital could not keep up with demand. And the chronic cases, or those cases that didn't uh, experience a cure right away and that stayed at the hospital for months or years on end began to accumulate. And so throughout the 19th century, patients were forced to sleep on mattresses in the hallways of the hospital. The growth of the hospital's population also created the necessity for additional farmland to feed the institution and employ laborers. Although the institution had 75 acres by 1845, its location meant that expansion was inherently limited. The city of Worcester was basically growing up around it. And at the same time, the hospital building was outdated and falling into disrepair. So in this picture, you can see how the hospital was presented in some of its uh, mid 19th century promotional materials. And this was a very beautiful, very bucolic landscape um, with a, a very palatial looking building. But as you can see, as depicted in, in other contexts of the time, um, 
the administrators of the building had failed to anticipate the way that Worcester would grow up around the institution. Over the course of the first 20 years of the hospital, Worcester transformed from a quiet village to a busy manufacturing city. And in the 1850s, the administrators uh, wrote in their annual report that the location is such as no one would choose for such an object at the present time. And for this reason, they started to discuss the possibility of building a new hospital in a different, better location. But because they didn't have the funds, that plan was basically put on the shelf for a few decades. Finally, in 1877, the new hospital was built. This hospital building was designed to address the shortcomings of its predecessor and represented a renewed dedication to moral treatment. To begin with, it was much larger than its predecessor. It was located in a rural area on 275 acres. It consisted of some very elaborate architecture and a sprawling, idyllic landscape. And it was designed really not just as a place where people would be cured, but a curative place in itself. This map shows the hospital about 10 years after it was built. And as you can see, this area of Worcester was very rural at the time, so that was ideal for moral treatment. But as the years went on, the same phenomenon occurred and the growth of the city would catch up again. The main building of the Worcester State Hospital was consisted of stone that was taken from a quarry on nearby Millstone Hill. And the plan of the building was built according to the principles of what was known as the Kirkbride Plan, named after Thomas Story Kirkbride of Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane. And according to the Kirkbride Plan, an institution was designed with a central administration building and then these series of staggered wings that branched out from either side. The principles of the Kirkbride Plan mandated that patients be organized within these wings according to their diagnostic category, their social status, and their behavior. So quiet patients were placed closest to the administration building and loud or violent or unruly patients were placed at the distal ends. And there was always the possibility for some degree of movement up and down this hierarchy of wings. So that was supposed to incentivize good behavior in patients. The landscape, oh, this, this is a plan of, of the Kirkbride Hospital. Um, the, and I should note that uh, the Kirkbride plan was not unique to Worcester, but was popularized throughout the country during this time. So it became iconic and, and very representative of hospital architecture. The landscape was also very carefully designed. The grounds of the hospital were intended to emulate a genteel garden or park with, with gardens, gazebos, and greenhouses. And although the landscape was intended to be enjoyed by patients, it was also created and sustained by their labor. The wards of the hospital, as I mentioned before, were divided among patients according to their diagnostic categories and class. So the better wards, as you can see here, which were outfitted like a typical 19th century parlor, were reserved for patients who were upper middle class and who were generally well behaved. Uh, whereas the less privileged patients or those who exhibited undesirable behavior were kept in relatively Spartan wards. Violent and ill-behaved patients at kind of at the bottom of the hierarchy were confined to unfinished cells. And as you can see, I don't have any pictures of the of those Spartan wards because these were the ones that were used in annual reports to promote to promote the hospital's image. For such a huge institution, it was necessary to employ a virtual army of laborers. And it was not considered unethical in the 19th century and well into the 20th for patients to be employed and to work without pay. In fact, it was considered part of their therapy. Um, the goal of self-sufficiency for the institution was never fully met, but it was still really essential for patients to work in order to keep the institution solvent. Labor was divided among patients according to their sex. 
So men, as you can see here, worked on the farm. They produced vegetables, meat, and dairy products. They also carried out landscaping, construction, carpentry, upholstery, and shoemaking. Women, on the other hand, were responsible for all of the traditionally feminine domestic duties of the hospital, such as laundry and general housekeeping. And they also, and as you can see in this picture, um, took part in a number of handicrafts. In this picture, they're spinning with what was, even at the time, rather old-fashioned spinning wheels. Um, and the proceeds from the sale of the items that female patients created were used by the institution to keep itself running. But patients were not always at work. A policy adopted in the late 19th century required that all patients who were well enough had to spend some time outdoors each day. And this was, the environment of the Worcester State Hospital was really ideal for this. The patients took part in a variety of outdoor sports and activities, including tennis, volleyball, golf, and hiking. As you can see here, a part of the Worcester State Hospital property once included about a half a mile of waterfront property along Lake Quinsigamond. And this was really wonderful for patients to be able to swim, to boat, and, and take part in all those water, various waterfront activities. This um, property was later traded to the city and became Lake Park, and this was seen as, as a major loss for the patients. Baseball was one of the most popular activities um, for patients at the hospital. Um, there were, in the normal course of, of playing baseball, teams of staff would play against teams of patients. But in the summer months, they formed teams of staff and patients representing Worcester State Hospital in games against other state hospitals in the state. So they would travel around to Medfield and Tewkesbury playing other hospitals. Despite all of the effort that had been put into the design and construction of the Worcester State Hospital, it pretty quickly fell victim to the same challenges that had uh, confronted its predecessor. To begin with, the building fell into disrepair due to lack of funds for upkeep. The administrators were basically always begging for funds from the legislature, which was very withholding. And then, for perhaps the, the most pressing issue was that overcrowding made it impossible to give the kind of individualized attention that really formed the core of moral treatment. And as a result of this, the character of the institution shifted from curative to custodial. To give you a sense of the scale of the overcrowding of the hospital, I should tell you that the, um, the organization that would later become the American Psychiatric Association mandated that, or rather suggested, since it wasn't something that was generally upheld, that hospitals of this type limit themselves to 250 patients because that was considered the maximum that could be accommodated at a hospital uh, while maintaining the principles of moral treatment. In practice, very few hospitals had fewer than 250 patients. Um, in fact, the Worcester State Hospital, the second version, was designed to accommodate 400 patients. In the course of its construction, that number was raised to, to 600. Um, and then by the first years of the 20th century, that number was 1,000. The peak population of the Worcester State Hospital was 3,000, which was reached in the 1950s. So you can imagine, or maybe you can't imagine, what it would be like to be in an institution designed for a few hundred patients that was ultimately, uh, ultimately occupied by over 3,000. In the first years of the 20th century, moral treatment came under attack by a new generation of psychiatrists who believed that insane people were really not as curable as was previously thought. And you can see how this would happen when you have these institutions in which the principles of moral treatment cannot really be put into place. Moral treatment appears not to be working. The result of this criticism was the rise of what subsequently came to be known as therapeutic pessimism in contrast to the optimism of the cult of curability. 
because of this pessimism and the way that psychiatry and, and uh, institutions for the insane were coming under attack in the early 20th century. A change in mission and identity was necessary for the Worcester State Hospital and for hospitals like it to survive. And so administrators decided to try to redefine the hospital as a center for scientific research and medical education. In doing this, they turned to the model that had been set by the new general hospitals, which were becoming increasingly popular during this time. Their goal in doing this was to make Worcester into a what they called a real hospital, as opposed to an asylum for helpless cases. They introduced new programs for education and research. They launched medical and surgical departments, and they took part in a movement in, at this time that brought psychiatry more securely within the auspices of medicine and science, where it had previously stood apart as something that just happened in asylums and other scientists and doctors don't really know what goes on there. In the course of the new experimental treatments and, and new research that took place at the Worcester State Hospital, patients were used as test subjects. And like patient labor, this wasn't considered unethical at the time. But all of these changes represented a distinct departure from moral treatment. Um, the hospital was no longer focused on the therapeutic environment or on holistic therapy. Instead, it was focused on primarily somatic therapies or therapies that were targeted at the body as the seat of disease. The, what, what you can consider per, perhaps one of the first or earliest somatic therapies in state hospitals was hydrotherapy. And in hydrotherapy, patients would be either immersed in hot or cold baths, um, they would be sprayed with water, or they would be wrapped in hot or cold towels, as you can see here. And this was supposed to introduce a physiological shock that would in turn affect the mind. It was basically a reset button. On the, on the mind that was um, obtained by targeting the body. In the 20th century, you see the growth of so-called shock therapies based on the same principles as hydrotherapy. So when I say shock therapy, most people associate it with electroconvulsive therapy or ECT, but there were other methods that were used in earlier years. In the 1930s, insulin was used to put patients into comas and the stimulant drug metrazole was used to induce seizures. And the same theory applied. If we can just hit the reset button of the brain, if we can introduce this massive shock to the system, maybe it will help mental illness. And this, these treatments came about almost by accident when you know, some doctor noticed that after a seizure, a patient appeared to be recovering better from their mental illness. And so these therapies did seem to improve symptoms in some patients, but they caused really serious side effects that were sometimes fatal. And for this reason, when ECT became um, introduced, it became the dominant method. And by the 1940s, metrazole and insulin had been phased out in favor of ECT. And I should note that ECT is still used in cases of major mental illness today um, with some, some good results. Psychology was also introduced to the Worcester State Hospital during this time, beginning with a series of internships of Clark University students in the hospital. Um, the psychology department was opened in 1922, and as part of this department, there were psychological experiments conducted on patients, and new techniques for diagnosis and treatment were developed. Dr. William A. Bryan, who's pictured here, was the superintendent of the Worcester State Hospital from 1920 to 1940, and he oversaw many of the most important changes during this time. Like Woodward, he had a profound degree of optimism about the power of the institution to cure mental illness, but he had a very different outlook and methods. These included new techniques of scientific management that were aimed at eliminating waste and optimizing efficacy. 
According to Brian's vision, the hospital should, vision, should function essentially like a therapeutic assembly line. Efficiency was the foremost goal. And Brian believed that as a result of this efficient system, patients would quickly cycle in and out of the hospital and some of its overcrowding would be relieved. In reality, however, the population of the hospital grew very quickly under Brian's tenure, more than doubling between 1900 and 1930. The Bryan Building, named after Dr. Bryan, was built in 1957 and was intended to usher in a new era for the Worcester State Hospital. It was designed in accordance with Bryan's principles of scientific management. However, its construction coincided with the beginning of deinstitutionalization, which is the process by which state hospitals were downsized and closed throughout the United States. In, in um, the years between 1950 and 1980, the population of the Worcester State Hospital was decreased from 3,000 to just 500. Now, this was not the type of relief of overcrowding that Dr. Bryan envisioned. He had thought that the hospital would be functional and efficient and that it would prove its own worth, when in fact, what brought about the release of patients was the belief that the hospital wasn't functioning, so it was just as well that patients sh should be released. By 1993, all of the remaining patients in the hospital had been consolidated in the Bryan Building, and the old Kirkbride Building had been left empty and abandoned. There were several factors that contributed to the decline of state hospitals during the late 20th century, including overcrowding, reports of abuse, the failure of experimental therapies, and the deterioration of the buildings. State hospitals were viewed as archaic and obsolete by the public. And also there was the promise of new therapies such as antipsychotics that could be administered on an outpatient basis. Like 19th century reforms, deinstitutionalization was built on the optimistic belief that a change in public policy could improve the lives of the mentally ill. But like moral treatment, it was undermined by a lack of follow through. State hospitals were supposed to be replaced by community mental health care, but these programs really never materialized in the way that the reformers envisioned. And instead, thousands of patients were released onto the streets without the resources they needed to survive. And in some case, cases, these patients had been confined for decades and had never really experienced life outside of an institution. Although the Worcester State Hospital survived deinstitutionalization, it did so on a drastically reduced scale. In the later 20th century, most of its property, which at its height was 500 acres, was subdivided and sold. The abandoned hospital was allowed to deteriorate and a massive fire gutted a lot of the building in 1991. The remainder of the Kirkbride building was demolished in 2008 with some notable exceptions. These exceptions include, as you can see here, the nurses residence, which was built in 1903, although that structure is now, I, I believe, in the process of demolition um, after several appeals to save it were lost. Um, there's the Hooper turret, which was a rather groundbreaking design for suicidal patients that was intended to make patients more visible to their caretakers by instituting a open layout where they could always be seen. And then, of course, the clock tower. The clock tower, as, as part of a deal that was reached between local activists, such as Preservation Worcester, um, with the state of Massachusetts was deconstructed and rebuilt brick by brick as an independent structure on the same site. And today it stands in front of a 320 bed hospital complex that was built in 2012. And that is the present day Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital. Although this hospital still operates under the jurisdiction of the state of Massachusetts, it bears very little resemblance to the old state hospital of the 19th and 20th centuries. But despite all the upheavals that have transformed the state hospital over the last centuries, the clock tower represents a point of continuity with the past 
that links previous generations with the experiences of employees and patients as they continue to unfold. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Madeline, for that very interesting program. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it as much as I did and learned, learned a great deal. So we have a couple of questions for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the relationship of, of the hospital itself to the community? Were, yeah. community? were there community volunteers? Were people invited to events at, the, at either location or in that, that long span from downtown to yeah. out on Belmont Street? That's an interesting question because when the hospital was for, first built, like any other um, institution designed under moral treatment principles, it was supposed to be kind of apart from the world. It was supposed to be a place where patients were secluded, even from their own families, for their own welfare, because it was thought that they had become mentally ill because of the environment they were in. So you had to separate them from everything around them in order to get a new lease on their mental health. But as time went on, um, it was kind of inevitable that the institution became really embedded in the community. I mean, large numbers of people worked and, and lived there. Um, it was really, I, when I think of the integration of the institution and the community, I think of the beginning of the 20th century during that period of revitalization that I talked about. And along with that reorientation towards research and, and, medicine, and science and medicine, there were the introduction of a lot of community programs. So people from the hospital would go out into the community to screen people for uh, mental health problems. And they would have more, they would have outpatient clinics. And then with the growth of occupational therapy, they would have regular, um, what would it be? like events where people from the outside were invited to see these presentations of crafts that were made inside the hospital. And there are a lot of pictures of this from the 1930s and 40s of, of these, these displays showing that this is what we do in the hospital, like come, come learn about it. So in that sense, um, it did become more integrated into the community. And I think, I mean, one of the most notable things I've noticed in doing all this research is the number of people who come up to me and say, I know somebody who worked there. So it what really was an institution in, in all sense of the word. Well, speaking of people who grew up there, we have a question. Um, it says, I grew up at the state hospital. My dad worked there and <laughs> lived great. in several of the cottages. Yeah. I heard stories about tunnels and sub tunnels and torture rooms. Are these stories true? Yeah. Um, there were subterranean tunnels. Um, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm not sure about their layout, but they're definitely, I've seen pictures and I've seen plans of, of tunnels connecting buildings. And, and the tunnels were really, they were common at, at state hospitals in New England in particular. And they were basically just an expedient to keep people from having to go outside. I mean, one example I can think of is that at one point, there were bathhouses that were located in an auxiliary building from the rest of the Kirk Ride. And so patients had to go outdoors to take a bath, like even in February. So they were much, I guess, less uh, cryptic or, or strange than you might think. They were really very practical. As for torture rooms, you're probably thinking there, there were a series of kind of iconic photographs that were published in the 1940s in Life magazine of experiments that were done in these subterranean rooms of the Worcester State Hospital. And... Um, to us, I mean, it certainly reads as like torturous things like um, they had rooms in which patients were heated to see how much they would sweat and there were spinning chairs to ch test their vestibular function. At the time, this was seen as, as necessary to the advancement of psychiatry, but of course we can look back nowadays and see how unethical that was. So another question from one of our viewers, how did the treatment of the mentally handicapped people differ from those with mental illness? Mm -hmm. So those were very much, even from the beginning, segregated. Um, or rather, I should say that in theory, they were segregated. Um, superintendents were very protective of the character of the institution, that this is an institution for the insane. And this is the 19th century. We have an institution for everything. And so you would have institutions for um, 
to use terms of the time, like idiots, feeble-minded, epileptics, alcoholics, and those were all supposed to be separate from a hospital for the insane. In practice, those delineations get a little muddy, and you see in annual reports, superintendents constantly complain about, we don't have the kind of people that we want in the asylum. We want this, you know, this specific diagnostic category, and what what state hospitals basically came would, would were a catch-all for people who basically couldn't belong anywhere else. Um, but there were a number of institutions for people with mental disabilities in the state, and they would have tried at least to funnel them into those. And and more questions about about um, practice. Two of them. How common were restraints before 1900? Mm. And were there other treatments used? And then, then another one, were lobotomies performed yeah. in either of the hospitals? Yeah, those are both really big questions. Um, the restraint issue was always a point of contention in the psychiatric community. So to begin with, as I said, moral treatment was founded on the premise that if we use moral treatment, we won't need restraint because patients will be so well taken care of and they'll cooperate with us, they'll trust us. And a lot of hospitals made a big deal of, of um, showing off how little restraint they would use. So in their annual reports, they say, we have 500 patients and only one of them is under restraint. In practice, I mean, when you read the accounts written by patients themselves, it seems like restraint was used quite extensively. And that would have included what you think of as traditional like straight jackets and collars and um, basically tying people to beds. But it would also include things like administering large doses of narcotics to quiet patients down. And then uh, I, I think you should also consider um, practices that would intimidate patients into cooperating. Um, like patients were, were, were threatened with various treatments, like hydrotherapy was used punitively. So restraint really was, uh, it, it was, it was controversial. Um, and doctors would go back and forth over arguing, is this a necessary evil or is this something that we can get rid of? And they never really came to res a resolution. As the years went on, um, you see the institution of practices such as the use of these little slips that you can find often in, in the archives of state hospitals that say this person was restrained for this amount of time as the administrators start to look down, look on these practices more carefully. And, and that was in response to some degree to the exposés that came out that were written by former patients. But I think you can see that throughout the 19th and 20th century history of state hospitals, restraint would have been, I think, a, a feature throughout. Um, and that, you, I, I wrote a little bit about this in one of my books about, um, I mean, obviously you can see how re restraint was used very unethically, very punitively, but at the same time, the attendants were untrained and they were um, understaffed and it was really a challenge to control large groups of patients. So everyone was kind of caught in a difficult situation brought about by the institution. As for lobotomies, yes, lobotomies, lobotomies were performed at the Worcester State Hospital. I think throughout the 30s, 40s, and possibly early 50s at the rate of maybe 10 a year. And a neurosurgeon from Boston would come in to perform them on site. And um, that, was considered standard practice at the time. I mean, we look back today at the lobotomy as, as a very um, horrific procedure, but it, it won the Nobel Prize. So it was, it was a very, it was a strange moment in which, in, this, in which that treatment was used and considered acceptable. And again, from one of our many viewers, can you say a, a little bit more about medication and the use of yeah. it to enable outpatient care you know, was it always successful? Mm. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, in medication and outpatient care, I didn't research this quite as much in, in, my, um, in my work because I, I focus mostly on the institution itself, and certainly medication was used extensively in the hospital. Um, that My understanding is that the early antipsychotics, while they had uh, pretty profound effects on some patients, 
also had a large degree of side effects and that for that reason and and still today um, patients were not always faithful about taking the medication and so the amount of kind of um, what would you call it uh, follow-up that was required to keep a patient on that regimen was was very ex extensive and they had those kind of outpatient clinics in the hospital, but again, there's always limited funding and, and limiting, limited staffing for them. Let's turn our attention for a few minutes to the, to the practical, the, the, the hospital itself. Yeah. There are a series of questions that, that all relate to its, its, its location and, mm -hmm. and some of the, the uh, legends about it. Mm -hmm. um, this question, why is it called Bloomingdale for part of its history? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me let me write let, let me read it all to you um did it have a cemetery was it haunted <laughs> and and did the original property include the the uh, land where umass med school is and the hospital are now yeah okay um bloomingdale i believe it was named after the section of worcester in which it was like that little area was known as bloomingdale you might know this better than i do um but it, it caused a bit of confusion for me for the, in researching this. There's also Bloomingdale Hospital in New York. Um, but that's, that's, I think, is the only real reason is that it was named after or called after the neighborhood. As for the cemetery, that's, that's kind of a complicated question. And um, there are different phases in, in <laughs> mortuary practices at the hospital. So to begin with, they buried patients in a very ad hoc manner in whatever cemetery would take them in downtown Worcester. So there were patients buried in Mechanic Street Burying Ground. Um, and then they got a dedicated lot in Hope Cemetery. So there's a section of Hope Cemetery that's set aside for patients, but all of those graves are unmarked. In 1918, that lot filled up, possibly because of, of the pandemic deaths. And so, the hospital switched and started using a cemetery that was located in Shrewsbury, where there was an auxiliary of its farm. So there's a little section of the Worcester State Hospital farm in Shrewsbury, and then they carved out a section of that to create the Worcester State Hospital Cemetery. And that was used from 1918 all the way up to, I, th I think pretty recently, like the last few decades, I think I've seen graves there from the 80s or 90s. And those graves were also originally marked only by numbers, but in the last 20 years, there's been a movement to actually uh, attach proper markers to those graves with, with names and all of that. Um, as for haunting, I, I can't really speak to that. I think every state hospital has some sort of story attached to it. And if you look through the history, you'll, you'll certainly find plenty of macabre stories that would, that would feed the, that, uh, sort of legend, but I can't speak, <laughs> I can't speak to any evidence personally. Uh, and as for UMass, yes, so you, the UMass Medical School is actually located on the farm, um, what would be the, the former farmland of the institution, because it was quite extensive, it went all the way down to the water. Thank you. And a, and a, and a question that's related to what we've all just lived through, yeah. what, what, what was happening at the, the hospital during the pandemic in the yeah. 1980s? Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. Um, certainly they had a lot of cases, but it wasn't the, I wouldn't describe it as the kind of event or marked event that you might think of it as simply because the hospital always seemed to be under some sort of epidemic illness. So whether it was dysentery or tuberculosis or um, diphtheria, there was, there was also always something brewing and that was the result of having large numbers of patients concentrated in one area and with pretty subpar sanitary facilities. So although the pandemic did touch the hospital, it was really just one in a succession of, of diseases that, that would have been pretty much an endemic to the institution. Thank you. Well, as our program starts to draw to a close, one, one sort of pair of questions that are related to each other. From your research, have you drawn any conclusions regarding the most effective approach to treatment of mental illness? And do you believe there is a need for institutional care for a certain population who are on the street and being taken advantage of? 
Oh, that's, that's, that's a really, that's a really big question. It's funny because I think in, in most of my research and in my books, I avoid being too prescriptive about what I think be, simply because I, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a lawmaker. And, and I think that's not really my purview, but I, I certainly have, I, I, I mean, I'm, certainly things have occurred to me and I, I have opinions about them. What, what seems to stand out to me is not necessarily, I don't have like a, a, any like overarching recommendation, but what has always occurred to me in looking through this is how medicine surrounding mental illness seems to be cyclical. So there are these discoveries about what is best for treating people with mental illness, like um, in terms of diet and recreation and, and wholesome food and, and the environment. And then with successive stages of psychiatry, especially with the introduction of psychoactive drugs, those lessons appear to be lost. And then, and then subsequent generations kind of rediscover them. So you'll see, um, you know, it, in, you can look through medical journals today and see how psychiatrists are studying the effects of nature walks on people with suffering from various mental illnesses. And then you think like, wait a minute, I, I know people who were saying that in 1830. And so I think it's not necessarily, I don't necessarily have one message about what should be done or should not be done. It's more like a series of little insights like that where, where, it's useful to look at the past because it wasn't all wrong all the time. It wasn't, it wasn't just misguided and we haven't just supplanted it, all of that. I think they had legitimate insights, even if though they lacked the knowledge and, and the, the ability to put those into practice. And then as for institutional care, there's a great article that's written, I think it might have appeared in, in the American Psychiatric Association Journal, but it was called Bring Back the Asylum. And it was a very provocative piece about why institutional care should be brought back. And I think, I mean, partly it was provocative because of the title and the idea that let's bring back these institutions that today have a lot of stigma and, and weight attached to them as historical creations. But I think there is something to be said, as I said before, about rediscovering the asylum as a model of treatment and what it can teach us about mental illness. Thank you. Thank you from all of us. Perhaps one last thought from sure. you before we conclude, and that is you've referenced books with, with, yeah. a, with a, a plural. Uh -huh. And I know everyone on the call is either is going to rush to try to <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. And just clean out the hundred books on their shelves um of copies of of the um the history books edition but tell us a little bit about a refuge of cure and care yeah. which is another publication so, yeah that is that book is basically my dissertation turned into a full-length book it's it's published by lexington books and uh it's a little like the the arcadia book is um, like in in that series, it's it's got great illustrations and a, and a great it's a great introduction to the Worcester State Hospital, a great overview of the whole thing. Um, if you want to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty, you can look at my other book because I get very um, in depth about the treatment that was used and the paradigm of mer moral treatment and what it meant. And um, so I I would I would look into that if if. If you read the first book and you just want more. <laughs> thank you. Again, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sure people who are on this call who are very excited to hear from you and whose questions are, who people who are disappointed that we were not able to get to their questions tonight or uh, we'll, we'll perhaps read both of them. So we thank you for, <laughs> for that. And we will we in, encourage all of our friends, and I'm sure Josephine will, will, will agree with me that Tidepool Bookstore is open on Tuesday through Sunday. We'll be happy to uh, support, supply you with a copy of Images of America's Worcester State Hospital. Um, in, the, in the meanwhile, we want to thank everyone for joining us this evening, thank our sponsors, and thank everyone who was able to be part of this program. Our um, sponsors, as you heard before, include the um, Greater Worcester Community, I'm, I'm sorry, Worcester Together Fund, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fred Harris Daniels Foundation, and the Mass Cultural Councils. Without them, 
them and without their support, we would not be able to bring you programs like this. And for those of you who have asked and, and have complimented in the, in the Q&A how good this program is and how excellent Madeline's presentation was, uh, this program is being recorded and in due time will be on our YouTube channel for Worcester Historical Museum. So we encourage you to watch and rewatch. Um, in the meanwhile, thank you for, again for joining us. Here's some contact information if you have more questions. I suspect Madeline Ryan at WorcesterHistory.net would be happy to answer them for you. Um, and, and when you're not um, curious about Worcester State Hospital and you want to know about more about Worcester, uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and take your place in Worcester history, but be sure to remember Tidepool Bookstore. We thank you for joining us again and wish you all a great evening. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Tidepool. Thank you, all of our friends.